I'm back visiting an old friend and martial arts legend, Eric Paulson. Our conversations range from traditional martial arts to MMA, the weakness of only training BJJ, the importance of weapons training, a lot of knives, and the popularity of leg locks. On the mats, Eric teaches some valuable clinch work and leg attacks. I'm an avid traveler, co-founder of budovideos.com, jiu-jitsu black belt, and lifelong student of the martial arts, who strives to know more about the competitors and instructors who are revolutionizing the jiu-jitsu lifestyle. Join me in my journey as I travel, train, learn, and get rolled up. Eric Paulson is a legend in martial arts. You name it, and Eric has probably trained in it. He's trained in various traditional arts, including Taekwondo, boxing, Muay Thai, Sabat, Jeet Kune Do with Dan and Asanto, and BJJ with the Gracie family and the Machado brothers from whom he received his Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Eric also put his training to the test, competing in mixed martial arts competitions around the world 17 times since the mid-90s, with a record of two wins by KO and eight by submission. Retired from competition, now Eric teaches full-time out of a CSW training center in Fullerton, California. Having coached famous fighters such as Brock Lesnar, Josh Barnett, Ken Shamrock, and Baba Lou, his students are blessed to have access to such an icon of the arts. Eric's teaching style is, how should I say it, generous. You'll never feel like he didn't show you enough moves in the class. Tonight, he runs us through some really smooth transitions from the clinch. So, Eric, what is combat submission wrestling? Combat submission wrestling originally was a submission wrestling program, which was catch wrestling. It was a mixture of catch, judo, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, and sambo. And this was before Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But then, because of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu influence that I had, I wasn't really allowed to teach jiu-jitsu. So I incorporated a lot of the positioning and drilling, but it was based off of a catch wrestling or combat wrestling system. The reason we call it combat submission wrestling, not just submission wrestling, is the fact that all of our guys were submission wrestlers, catch wrestlers, and all of them fought in MMA. So that was the combat aspect, was everything that we did was based on fighting. Like if we were doing submission wrestling, it was great, but it was a segue to get into fighting because I was having a fight career at the time and I trained tons of guys that were fighting. So everyone said, well, what is CSW? And I go, well, it's a submission wrestling base and then it's the MMA on top of it. Now you have uh, obviously a lot of respect for traditional martial arts. Sure do. Uh, I know you trained a lot in Jeet Kune Do and, uh, and so many different styles. Why, what is this, why do you respect traditional martial arts so much? Teaches you manners, teaches you how to act, code of conduct, uh, the Buddha warrior code, um, and respect, which is lost. You know, you're getting guys that start competing and fighting, and they just lose respect for things, you know? and. Uh, there's a lot about ego. It's supposed to keep you humble, and the, and the better you get, the more humble you're supposed to be. You're not supposed to be a big braggadocious egomaniac. Mm -hmm. You know, you're supposed to humble yourself and get small. And the bigger you get, the smaller you should be. And that's what I believe. Do you think that's lacking in most MMA schools? That specifically just do MMA and, and train fighters? Yeah, of course, because they, they don't, uh, they don't honor the Bushido warrior code uh, thing. Uh, the other is, is the discipline factor of bowing in and bowing out. Uh, if you're late, you do push-ups. Uh, no swearing. Profanity is forbidden. And w the way I was brought up, we weren't allowed to swear. We weren't allowed to talk crap. You weren't allowed to talk back. You weren't allowed to make smart-ass comments and talk under your breath. 
and I'm seeing guys do that all the time. And, you know, it just, it's infuriating because here I've been doing martial arts for so long and then all of a sudden I see these, these some of these new fighters that are little smart asses and you walk in and you put your ear in the locker room and you listen to them talk, you're like, what the hell? You know, like, I thought martial arts is supposed to make you a better person. I don't, I didn't think it was for you to sit and, and talk shit to your buddies about people and things and, uh, I don't really like that aspect to, of it. Uh, I don't like the fact that it, it's all about ego and me, 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 I, I, I. And a lot of people forget about their coaches and their teachers. And MMA is like an open door for a fighter to get good and then just start gym jumping and not have one coach or one teacher. Yeah. And I understand if you have somebody that doesn't have all that. And there's a lot of guys out there that don't have the complete package. You get guys that, that actually um, are, are really good at grappling and maybe they, they have a bring a striking coach in. Or some guys are great strikers, but their ground game isn't good, so they bring a jiu-jitsu guy in. But to find a gym that is com a complete package where they have striking, clinching, throwing, takedowns, uh, elbows and knees, uh, wrestling, uh, judo sambo catch wrestling brazilian jiu-jitsu that's a that's a really rare package to find mm -hmm. for sure eric i know you love leg attacks what are your favorite knee bar setups um knee bar setups uh i think one good position to start attacking legs is half guard because there's a lot of attacks from half guard okay so you want to hit a few from half guard yeah which okay. half guard do you like to attack um, from regular or knee shield or? A, uh, well, let's we'll start with just, uh, let's say you have a knee shield, mm -hmm. and I take the knee shield out. And then I start to come here. Mm -hmm. That's my first back to the knee bar, which is a, a very fast, real easy one. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're in, with the knee shield, you pop, then you start to bring this through, and then post, and tripod and come up. That's one. Okay. Another one from half guard, let's see, I'll go flat half guard, mm -hmm. is you block and you shin through here. And when you shin through, that's going to be your knee attack. Mm -hmm. So, one more half guard. Yeah. Yeah. You block, and your shin goes across, and then when you slide here, this comes through. Figure four. It's really good torque with the heel too. Yeah. You're not just holding the leg, you're holding the heel. Yeah. So the old style was to knee slide through. You would knee slide through, come to here, and finish with the heel and the knee. Mm -hmm. Then later on, when we we're here, we would pump and this would kick over to the same attack, which is a four spinning knee bar from flat, and you loop, saddle, sit, and knee bar. Was it thinking that the sweeping the leg over is faster? Uh, What's the advantage of swinging the leg over instead of the knee cutting? I think if you sit up on them and you're punching, you can do it. Mm. But if they're tight, then you knee slide. You've been teaching it all for so many decades, and obviously you've got your jiu-jitsu black belt as well. You've trained with the Gracies, you've trained with the Machados. What do you think is the limitation or the weakness of somebody who just trains grappling? Well, you have to look at it, again, for fight, uh, as a fighting aspect, because in troubled times, like self-defense, that's what it was originally created for, was self-defense. So everything needs to be based on uh, how applicable or how you can apply it in a uh, life-threatening situation and not just against one person and not within a rule set where you got an angry biker or an angry uh, trucker that would rather punch your face in than eat his meal and you got your hands full or you're fighting two or three different people and is there a weapon involved? Because most of the time there is. No matter what, like, you're, anytime you have a situation, that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, it's not a good idea to get out of your car 
because you know, road rage, someone usually pulls something out because they don't know how to fight, so they don't fight fair. And fair for them is having a baseball bat or a knife. That guy just stabbed that kid the other day out of nowhere by the parking ramp. Uh, knives are hidden and they're fast. Knives faster than a gun. But a gun is good for longer range. But man, if you haven't seen uh, Surviving an Edge Weapon with Guru Dan and Asano, he was like, I forget if it was 18 to 20 to 22 feet away from the police officer and he put his head down and he ran and he stabbed the guy. And he got the knife in the guy. He, he touched the guy with the knife before he could draw his gun. So I think it's, that's another factor. There, there needs to always be assumed that there's a weapon involved anytime you have an excursion. So the first thing you have to do is situ situational awareness. You look, you look at their hips, you look to see if they have a bulge in their pocket uh, or a clip on their hip, or if they have, a, if they're uh, puffy up front, maybe a gun or in the back. Mm -hmm. So you always have to be aware also of their hands, where their hands are, how close they're getting to you. If you're staying square, if you're turned sideways, if you're talking with your hands up or your hands up, yeah. that's extremely important. So self-defense is the first thing that's important. And then in the end, after you do all your sports stuff, you might have an excursion. I mean, the odds of you having an excursion are super high. And what about, what about when there's no food? And what about when there's chaos in the streets and people are just hitting people and attacking people and breaking into houses because they don't have food? How are you going to defend yourself? Do you have weapons? Do you know how to use your weapons? Do you know how to take weapons away? You know, do you, do you know how to shoot a gun? Are you going to be able to get to your gun? Do you have knives? What if you're in the bathtub or the, the shower? Do you have knives in your in your room, under your pillows, next to your bed, in your drawer, on the side stand, in the bathrooms, in the kitchen? I mean, when you're watching TV and somebody breaks in your house and, it, it, you know, they kick your door down and there's three guys and they have guns, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So Eric, I haven't been to your house, but I'm getting this picture in my head. <laughs> I'm wondering how many weapons do you have hidden around your home? A uh, lot of knives, a lot of knives, uh, which is extremely important. And uh, I've read a lot, uh, and they said one of the best things for, for home self-defense is a shotgun. Mm -hmm like a short shotgun, tactical shotgun. Right. Hey guys, I'm here to tell you about the world's best fight shorts, the Nogi Ghost. If you've ever owned a pair of our shorts, you know these things last forever. With the Ghost, of course, there are no outer pockets that toes or fingers can get caught in. The high quality embroidered logos will never fade or come undone. They come in six different colors and two lengths, a seven inch inseam or a shorter five inch inseam if you wanna show off your quads. The flexible gusset and the four-way stretch material will ensure that you don't feel restricted in any of your movements. The stretch waistband and drawstring allow for a bit of variance in your weight. Whether you add a few pounds or cut a few, they'll still fit perfectly. And lastly, if you're like me, you might wear your shorts outside the gym on occasion, so we have a hidden inner pocket for your phone or keys. I can proudly say the Ghost is the best fight short in the world, and I hope you'll give it a try. Now, a lot of people have never seen this one because this is actually part of combo 10 from Shudo. So anytime you're in half guard here, what they do is they start to lift. When they lift here, the knee comes here. And you just sit straight back. So you're in half guard, you block, and you put your knee here, but you gotta get the underhook. Without the underhook, it doesn't work. So when we start, we try to get the underhook first, then we go here, and then you just sit. And then this, figure four. Back up top. Now, a lot of times from this, from the toe hold, you hit the dive row toe hold, right? Mm -hmm. Bang. And you straighten your leg, so what I'm gonna do when you kick out is put uh, go back, just straighten your leg out. So you're gonna put the foot down and then re-roll and come back up. Mm -hmm. So when you're in for the half guard, and you go for the dive roll toe hold right here and look what happens, the person straightens. Mm -hmm. So straighten my foot, put my foot on the floor, 
Put your head on the floor and roll backwards and go right back and then you come under and then you finish it backwards, okay? So I used to do that a lot because the dive rope toe hold, when they hit it, you can defend by straightening it out. Mm -hmm. But by putting the foot back down, you just roll back and they have no defense when they're face down. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. So if you're here and you hit the dive rope toe hold, bang, look at it, straighten out. Put it back down and go right back over and go back and that's how you toe hold. Yeah, it's a nice combo. Um, Mishimi did that versus Jimmy Ambrose. Jimmy Ambrose is super heavyweight. He's got super strong legs. And when Mishimi, no, not Mishimi, it was uh, Minowa Man. Minowa Man hit it in pride. And I knew right away he was going to straighten out and kick out. And I, I, I said to myself, I hope he knows the re-roll. Because mm -hmm. you go for it and then you go back the other way. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And submitted him with it. And I was like, man, that's perfect. Because yeah. a lot of guys don't know the double-sided. Because the strong guys are going to kick out. Mm -hmm. uh, so same thing when you're mounted. A lot of people, uh, I don't see them use this much. But anytime you're mounted and maybe I'm working or whatever, I, what I'll do is I'll put a hook here. So I take my hook and I put it here. And then when I do that, this is fast, but I come up, back spin, and hit the knee bar. Mm. So when you're mounted, like this, so what you're going to do is put a hook in and put your toes on the floor. You have it not yet. And then you're going to put two hands right here. Now you're gonna pop your hip and then just spin backwards. Other way, backwards, backwards, this way. Yeah, and then hook, mm -hmm. and then go for the leg. Gotcha. So that one works really well. When you're here, and you put a hook here, then as soon as you put your hook in, you go here. Mm-hmm. Nice. And the same, like if you're down, and then here, you go here, and I go like this, and this is always the knee bar attack from here. Mm -hmm. Okay. You call that reading the Sunday paper, right? The uh, morning newspaper. The morning newspaper, yep. So, anytime I'm here, I go here, boom, and left. And what happens for him is he's gonna, he's gonna push on my hips and straighten his legs. So I let him go. And then I rotate. Then this is easy for you to come back. And that just makes a few different forward spin, back spin, and dive roll toe hold, knee attacks. So Eric, it's almost been three decades that you've been teaching out of CSW. Uh, what's the direction of the school going now? Uh, well, the direction of the school is our jujitsu program, I said when I'm retired from fighting, I'm going to put my gi back on because I love the gi, I love the judo, I love the jiu-jitsu, and you can kind of just get into it and learn all the intricacies and enjoy it when you don't have to worry about a fight coming up where you're not wearing any gi or kimono. You know, I took it off. I took my gi off when I was fighting. I just said I'm not going to wear a gi because I don't see the correlation right now of gi versus no gi. And then when I, when I got done, I was glad to put it back on and start teaching class because I had had so much training in the gi with so many great guys. And I just thought, you know what, I, want, I just want to start rolling around. And the other thing is it just gets you come. You know, a lot of guys that, that don't wear the gi and then put a gi on, they roll, they're uncomfortable. And they feel uncomfortable and they don't understand the grips and they worry too much. and. Uh, once you put the gear on and start rolling for a couple months, you get used to it. You get used to the grips. You get used to guys tugging and pulling on your clothes or holding you. And it teaches you to move a little differently and be more creative. And uh, one thing that I love about the gi class is the, just the variations with all the gi manipulation and the chokes. You know, and I figure if you're just going to roll and do, do sweeps and things that don't involve the cloth, why don't you just take your gi off? Yeah. So use the gi as much as you possibly can with the manipulation of the, the toggles and the, and the rope theory and then uh, the push-pull and the twisting and, 
and uh, the leverage factor, that's one thing that I like, and then the manipulation of the cloth. Um, and, uh, and then you take a guy, let's say you take a person that's not as good as you uh, in the no-gi, but then they have a little more of a chance with the gi if they, because it slows the game down, because they can hold you and you can't attack as fast. Yeah. So that's one thing. Uh, so the jiu-jitsu, we mix the judo sambo and wrestling with the jiu-jitsu, which makes it fun. Mm -hmm. And then we have a no-gi class right after. Uh, I found that most guys quit doing the no-gi and then started doing the gi because of the belt promotions. Uh, but it's also fun and they see that everyone else is doing it and I let everyone roll with everybody, which keeps the community. You know, a white belt gets to roll with a black belt and uh, I don't just separate and go, this is only black belt only, this is only high belt only. Uh, and everyone gets to help everybody, so the gym is constantly helping. And then I have a competition class that uh, guys just come in and they just do their 40 straight minutes of straight rolling for 40 straight minutes. And it's just a straight live go um, competition class where you're getting yourself tired and you don't have time to think. There's no teaching, no talking. You just go and go and go for 40 straight minutes. Uh, and then and then the nogi class I think is fun because it's a lot of wrestling and I, I just think it helps I think everyone needs to learn how to wrestle including high school and junior high teachers yeah. It should be compulsory that teachers are learning how to wrestle look at all the nonsense going on in school and all the kids Fighting back mm -hmm. and I was in Australia and they were making it compulsory for the teachers to learn how to wrestle It's a great idea and I think police officers and I think teachers all need to learn how to wrestle, mm -hmm. just to control. That, that one kid jumped on that lady because he took her, she took his Xbox, mm -hmm. and he was beating her, and no one knew how to take that, even tackle him. Took and, five people. To yeah, drag him off. and they're trying to grab his arms. They had no idea. Mm -hmm. They could have one person on each arm and drug him, drug him off, and then one person on top could have sat on him. Yeah. That's frustrating. But uh, so I, I think the wrestling. I believe the wrestling, even in jiu-jitsu class, your jiu-jitsu and wrestling need to be mixed together. Not just, you know, I'm just a pure jiu-jitsu stylist. Well, you look at most pure jiu-jitsu stylists now are all wrestling up from bad positions. So they're learning how to wrestle out and come up and go on top and reverse and take top control or top position. So that's extremely important. and. Uh, I take I took a couple of uh, Hickson's old students and they came in to roll later on after I hadn't seen them for quite some time. Mark Eckhart was one. And he started rolling. And I watched him and I go, wow, did, did you wrestle in high school? He goes, no. And I go, where'd you learn that? And that and that. He goes, from Hickson. And I go, that's wrestling. Mm -hmm. So there is wrestling in his jiu-jitsu because it helps you to get out of bad, it's called scrambles or whatever. It helps you to get out your sit-outs. Uh, some of the turns and things, the barrel roll from the underhook, um, the long sit-out, the short sit-outs. I think it's extremely important. And, and if it wasn't, then why was Holes so aggressive in his style as one of the top competitors in the family? It was because he took his jiu-jitsu and then he added the aspect of the wrestler's mentality, which was the aggressiveness. And then also the top game and wrestling and going on top and putting them on their back. And then he did Sambo too, so that helped him to learn leg locks. Uh, one thing I did have is one of the best private lessons from Master Higgin. He brought me in and because of the fact I had neck surgery, he goes, I'm not gonna let you do any technique. And I go, but that's what a private's for. I thought we're gonna do some technique. And he goes, no, we're gonna talk about the history of jujitsu. It was the best private ever. <laughs> okay. He told me about Helio having an arm bar and a cross choke. That was his game. And then Holes went out and trained with some of the judo guys and came back with a triangle. And then later on, the Ezekiel choke was from a judoka. Okay. Yeah. He, he created the Ezekiel choke. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's interesting because um, a lot of the guys were judo guys. And, and there was a big crossover because the Newaza from the judo really really uh, helped promote, because a lot of the guys were super tough at throwing and holding and pinning. And then it was the the ability to shrimp. Yeah. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. You look at a lot of the 
the judoka guys, uh, a lot of them don't shrimp so much, especially in Sambo. Mm -hmm. And that was one way that Josh beat uh, one of his fighters. He took him down, Kartanov. He f took him down, mounted him, and I said, all you gotta do is just kick off to Katagatami, either Katagatami choke or Fat Man, and those two go side to side, just in case uh, uh, Katagatami is a head and arm choke. And then the Fat Man choke is just basically a cradle with the arm instead of over, it's arm under, and you sit out with it. It's a wrestler's head and arm pin. Mm -hmm. And those two work so well together. And uh, Josh hit that on Brett Rogers and Kartanov because they had no shrimp. Uh -huh. They had no hips. Right. So when he'd get mounted, they would just try to buck him off. And I go, glue your hips to the floor. Saturday night ride, which is hooks in, hips down, low mount, hook the head, wait, 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 pin, and then boom, duck under, and then dismount. Uh -huh. That was it. But if you look at that, that's wrestling and judo. You know, it's not prominent in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but it works. Katagatami choke, I think, works so well. It's, it's easy to use on almost everybody. Sure. And a lot of people don't know how to get out of it. It's pretty useful. But the game today, I think uh, everyone's doing the leg locks, but then that's why you should be doing arm locks. Yeah. And you should be doing chokes. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the neck cranks? Are they legal? Because a lot of people want to learn neck cranks now. And wrist locks, which they say was last resort, which is no longer last resort. Uh, you'd get booed if you did them, right? Yeah. I got booed in my first leg lock uh, in, in 96 or 86, no, 96 of the Pan Ams. I hit a leg lock on a Brazilian and <laughs> everyone booed. Yeah, yeah. not anymore. Best compliment you can give back to class or to the teacher is using the stuff that you learn in class while you're rolling. And if you didn't catch it, it might be homework for you. You got to refine it. Jake, what do you think? I want to thank you guys for welcoming me into your gym. You guys got an awesome place here. I hope you guys appreciate how awesome of a place it is. Sometimes if you're in one place the whole time, you don't really know. But I've traveled all around the world and I know that this is an awesome place. Eric's an amazing coach. He has so much knowledge. Every time I meet him, he tells me a ton of things that I've never we heard trade, before. We trade. We trade a little bit. That's how, we, that's how you, the best way to learn is when you have a friend come in that trains somewhere else and you guys can trade information. That's important. It's the only way to grow. Thank you. Jake, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Combat Submission Wrestling is really the best of many worlds. From his decades of study of traditional and modern martial arts, Eric's Gi classes provide all the fundamentals integral to any BJJ school, while his no-gi and MMA classes provide real-world skills tested in competition. Eric eats, breathes, and lives the way of the warrior and is a shining example of someone who has devoted his life to learning, testing, and sharing his love for the martial arts. Thanks for watching this episode of Rolled Up with Eric Paulson. As we talked about in the show, Eric has trained in a wide variety of arts, and I have as well. How about you? Do you cross-train in various arts? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you want to see bonus footage not included in the episode, you can. In the bonus clips for this episode, Eric talks about the origins of jiu-jitsu and shows some devastating leg locks. Become a valued Rolled Up subscriber at budovideos.tv and see past episodes and bonus footage. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next one and keep on rolling. There was a